Uh, so this talk, we're going to be talking about Kubernetes operators. And my name is Doreen Porque. Uh, I currently work for AWS. I changed my job as I had applied for this um, uh, job, uh, as I applied for this um, talk. And um, this is mostly about what I've done at my previous role. Uh, so a little bit more about me is that I have been working in the uh, infrastructure backend area for um, maybe around six or more years. Uh, I've started working at uh, very big enterprises uh, like GE. That's where I got my first um, experience with containers. Um, and then I uh, got a little bit tired of enterprises and how big they are and how like um, there's different policies and so on and so forth. So I started working at a small startup, uh, downtown Louisville, um, again, with in infrastructure and systems engineer roles. Uh, after that, I uh, moved to a role, uh, which was for a unicorn startup uh, based out of Seattle. It's called Auth0. And uh, it's basically authentication as a service company. Uh, I joined that job because I thought it was challenging to be responsible for designing, implementing, and being on call for systems that can never be down. So authentication is basically like a phone line. It can never be down. So um, that's where I've spent uh, around three years and, and then uh, moved on from that job as well. But this is going to be mostly about um, what we try to implement uh, at my previous role. So I'll share my screen. So uh, let's go ahead and start talking about some fundamentals. I assume that, uh, you know, when you've seen the title of this talk and uh, you've seen Kubernetes, you have some knowledge uh, or experience with containers. Uh, but I think as a refresher, it's good to talk about what are containers. So, um, I remember working in contain with containers in 2016, and that was a fairly relatively new concept. Docker, the most container, um, the most famous container runtime platform, describes containers as the standard unit of software that packages up code and all this dependency to so application runs quickly and reliably from one computing environment to another. And that's a fairly good statement about Docker. Um, as you can see on the uh, diagram on the right, so you have your infrastructure, um, you have your host operating system, and then Docker daemon runs on your operating system with containers launching on top of uh, op the operating system. And the difference between uh, what most people wonder between containers and VMs is that uh, VMs don't share a host, uh, but containers do. Um, this is beneficial in different ways. So uh, containers are very portable. So you would just have um, a Docker file is where you would define your container and you would say, this is the, all the packaging, this is all the software it needs. And that's how you deploy it. You create an image from that Docker file and it gets deployed. That makes it so that the launch speed is pretty fast. You know, when you want to launch VMs, bootstrapping VMs takes more time. Containers are much faster. Um, and like I said, the packaging and deployments are much easier. Um, some people say security, a lot of times I've read, um, actually for this talk, I was wondering what people think benefits of containers are. Um, having had experience running container platforms, uh, I always wonder what people are trying to get out of containers. And a lot of times security comes up and that's fair. There's more security, I suppose, from running um, different containers on a host versus um, processes, all processes on a host. Um, but they're still sharing a host. So that's why I put security in a parentheses. Um, and another benefit is that a lot of times containers are used in migration from monolith to microservices, which again, I put it in parentheses because I don't necessarily disagree. A lot of times it's just wrapping, that means wrapping a monolith into a different packaging and deploying it in a different way. 
uh, but sometimes uh, containers encourage a microservice a service is only created for one single purpose approach so I think it's fair to say that that is another advantage of having uh, containers so let, uh, let's just say that you know you're just playing around with containers on your uh, workstation you just have a bunch you just have two or three or if you're running it at home for use you just have maybe five or six and it's possible to run that with docker compose or other smaller tools that you can use but once it gets to production it has different requirements you know it's uh, when you want to run your containers in production you would have not five, you might have thousand containers. You might need observability. You might need to make sure that um, logs are being sent to the right places. Uh, make sure that containers are running like two at a time, three at a time, or something like that. So that's where the container orchestration platforms come in. So basically what a container orchestration platform does is to uh, take off that differentiate, differentiated heavy lifting where you have to uh, figure out where to deploy your containers. These 2,000 containers that you have, how many? How are you going to decide which one to deploy to which host? How many are you going to decide how many hosts do you need? Uh, so th this is where container orchestration helps. And the most famous uh, container orchestration flat platform is currently Kubernetes. Um, the reason why Kubernetes is so popular is first of all, it's open source. It came out of Google's own implementation. It's not exactly Google's own implementation, but it's um, similar to inspired by Google's implementation of containers. And um, it, it is open source. It has a lot of features that um, are very um, good to use. For example, a concept of always keeping your five of your containers running. Um, and it has a lot of features like, you know, being able to interact with it with uh, a command line called kubectl. Uh, and everything is basically declarative when you're interacting with Kubernetes. So uh, you would basically write a lot of YAML. You would define the same way you would define a Docker file. You would have YAML files that define the different resources that your Kubernetes uh, clusters should have. Uh, so this is the, the talk we're going to mostly focus on Kubernetes. I mean, all of it is just going to be Kubernetes as a platform. So that's a little bit about Kubernetes as a platform. Um, we're going to be talking about operators. So um, in the context of what we think of Kubernetes operators, we have to think about what does an operator do? You can think about it in a sense of like, if you want to run a database, on top of Kubernetes or on top of any other platform, really. Um, you would need to create this database. Some, someone, a person, has to create the database, take backups, um, do schema migrations, create indexes, uh, and all sorts of things that you have to do to administer a database. It's just like a person manually doing it, an operator, if you will. And an operator in a Kubernetes world essentially wants to or aims to replace that person. So it, it an operator basically extends Kubernetes API. So um, a little bit about Kubernetes internals. Kubernetes has an API uh, in its control plane called API server. And that API is an event-based uh, system where events just come through and that API just signals based on the events that it's receiving. Um, so what you can do with an operator, a Kubernetes operator, you can extend that Kubernetes API. So for example, you would create a slash database. And when a user comes in, uh, it can be a user, uh, it can be you saying kubectl um, and then give a manifest, it's basically that YAML file to create that uh, database, or it could be another tool interacting. It could be a Helm chart or Ansible or another tool interacting with your cluster saying, hey, I want a Postgres database. And what happens is that that API object gets created in your um, Kubernetes cluster. 
the operator is always watching for events. So it notices that there's an API object for uh, a database and type of Postgres. Then what it does is that it schedules pods for the database. So it starts scheduling pods to say, hey, let's create a Postgres database. So this is a simplified version of what essentially an operator does. Uh, behind the scenes of how it works, it's um, a little bit more complicated, but it's the best way that I can explain it is to explain it with a feedback system. So this is in particular is the reason why I like operators as a concept, at least you're going to see more in the uh, in my next slides. But um, essentially, an open feedback system takes some input, processes it, and then throws out an output. You can think of that as um, a washing machine or a dryer. So let's just take a dryer for an example. You just put wet clothes in, the dryer does some operations on it to dry it, and then you would get some dry clothes out. Um, what a closed loop feedback system is, is that it's not just an input output process, there's also a loop for feedback involved. So again, the dryer example, you would take the dryer, uh, you would put your wet clothes in the dryer, and um, with the open feedback system, sometimes you might get damp clothes because the dryer didn't dry them enough. But with a closed loop feedback system, you would put the wet clothes, and then there's a process for feedback. There's a sensor in the dryer that senses how wet the clothes are, and then it outputs the dry clothes correctly every time as you wished. So that is essentially what an operator is trying to do. It has a desired output, and then it's taking some input, and it's trying to do some process and do some magic on that output, on that process to uh, create the desired outcome. And like I said, I know that a lot of you, if you have uh, seen this talk and see the name of Kubernetes, you might have some experience with uh, Kubernetes and I played around with it or have been using it in production. If we were doing this in person, I would have asked, you know, raise your hand if you have, but we're not, unfortunately. So, um, but a quick refresher on some Kubernetes concepts that are good to know uh, or need to know before you start playing around with operators is uh, the concept of resources. So the concept of resources is basically anything you uh, deploy in a Kubernetes cluster. So pods, pods are essentially the smallest um, uh, object in the Kubernetes world. Uh, you have your config maps, you have your secrets, all these things we will consider those uh, resources. Then resources on their own are nothing. They're just declaration of things. They're just YAML files. For resources to be useful, you need something called a controller. So a controller could be deployments, replica set. Um, in, te in, in terms of controllers, for example, replica sets, it always assures that certain amount of pods are running on your cluster. So that's what it's the action that it's taking on the pods and is using that control loop to, um, to make sure that you always have two pods running. So the operator framework essentially extends these two things. So it ex extends the resources uh, with custom resource definitions. Uh, the custom resource definitions are essentially the resources you see above, but you can create your own. You can declare your own, and it's just going to be a YAML file that uh, specifies what your resource definition is. What is this new resource? And I'm going to give an example of that in a second. And a custom controller is that what should that object, what, what it should be done on that resource, essentially. Um, you need these two concepts uh, to create an operator. For that to make sense, I have an example of what a custom resource definition is, a CRD is usually called. So again, it's YAML, and I've taken this from um, AWS yesterday. They announced that they are they have built controllers for Kubernetes. Um, essentially, what they have done 
is that they have created these operators for their platform, for different services in their platform. And this in particular, the screenshot that I have is the custom resource definition for Amazon S3, which is their object storage. So within their ob object storage, they have different concepts of uh, buckets, for example, is where they store uh, different objects, right? So as you can see here, you have your API versions. This is the API you're extending. You have the kind custom resource definition. And then you would have, this is the, uh, I'm going to talk about this in a second. This is your controller's version. And then you would have your naming. This is just a name to uh, distinguish uh, this resource from others and so on. And you would have kind bucket. So it's essentially just um, implementing the features of Amazon S3 and as a um, custom resource definition in um, Kubernetes. And what this essentially does is that it can do many things. So it is supposed to do everything that you can do with an S3 bucket uh, and any features that they have, you can do it with an operator. For example, you would have a controller, like I mentioned, a closed loop um, feedback system where you have a current state and a desired state. Um, and what your operator does is to continuously watch and analyze the difference between your current state and your desired state. So in terms of that um, custom resource definition that we just looked at, that there's a bucket, your current state might be that you don't have a bucket, um, but you have sent a signal, you have sent an event uh, to your API that I do actually want a bucket, um, this is its name, so on and so forth. So that is your desired state. So the operator is constantly watching, analyzing, and the most importantly, reconciling these events. So your current state is always going towards your uh, desired state. So that is essentially the um, concept that you will be implementing in a Kubernetes operator. So um, to talk about how to write an operator and requirements, uh, it's usually if you want to do a step-by-step -step with a group of people in a workshop, it, it's gonna be a difficult thing. I thought about doing this. Uh, I chose not to do it for this session because there's a lot of pre, I wouldn't say there's a lot, there's decent amount of prerequisites. So you have to have a good understanding of Kubernetes and it's not just about um, knowing what is a pod or knowing what is a deployment. So these are, um, this is a pretty advanced topic when it comes to Kubernetes concepts and it's a concept that most people don't necessarily need to use or don't use they just are happy running their either running their kubernetes cluster or using a managed uh kubernetes platform and they're fine with it and and that's also fair so um but you need to have an understanding of kubernetes resources custom resources and controllers and how they work um, and you basically have to dig into their APIs to understand this and write an operator. You need to have a good knowledge of Go um, and Kubernetes, like I mentioned. There are different ways to write an operator. You can use the operator SDK. So essentially, this is um, the framework that CoreOS in 2016 introduced. Um, so it's operator SDK. You can use it with Ansible which is a configuration management tool. You can use it with Go, you can use it as Helm, and Helm is basically the how you get your software installed on Kubernetes clusters. Um, and you might be able to do limited things with Helm. You may not be able to implement uh, control loops where they constantly reconcile a state, uh, but you can go very far with Go because you can just code as you go. Um, the one thing that I do recommend and I have used previously is Cube Builder. Now, Cube Builder, I put a link there. That's like essentially a book. Uh, it's basically a scaffolding project. Um, the reason why I recommend Cube Builder is because it is just a command line tool and it essentially takes care of 
uh, all the scaffolding you need to do, and you would just fill in the spots. Um, and it has a lot of nice features where you can recompile um, your code and it will automatically add, it has a features like comments where it automatically adds uh, your functions as needed. So I highly recommend Cube Builder if you are planning to write your own operator. It also has an example um, where it's fairly simple example that you can follow step by step in their book. Um, it's basically creating a cron job as an operator. And if you follow that step by step, a lot of things will come clear to you. The meaning of custom resource definition and reconciling and all that will be uh, will come clear to you. So that's definitely how I would and I have uh, implemented an operator. So this is an interesting part of the talk because uh, I talked all these things about Kubernetes operators, and um, it seems like I'm vouching for it uh, to some extent, but also to some extent, I want to put this slide to say that there is instances where I would not write an operator, and there are many. Um, I'm going to go through those, and I know it might be confusing, but I will explain why I still like operators. But essentially, this has come from experience, my experience in the trenches. So <laughs> what I've, um, my actual experience has been trying to write operators and why I wouldn't recommend you to write one. So is it a good idea to write an operator? So the one thing that I realized was that it's very difficult to scope an operator. Um, you know, when you're trying to automate something, like to automate, um, for example, a creation of a MySQL database or any automation in general, uh, you never want to leave it halfway there. So your automation does half of something. Well, oh, the automation just creates the MySQL database. It does not delete it. It doesn't update it. Um, you don't want to do these leaky abstractions that um, are going to confuse everyone. So they're going to confuse your new hires. It's going to confuse your current staff that oh, are we actually using this to launch uh, databases? And what's the process? Oh, the process for deleting it is not an automated process. You actually have to follow a document. So I per when we decided to write operators. I didn't want that to happen to me. And I was not necessarily striving for perf perfection or letting perfection get in my way. But it was very difficult to scope an operator. What does an operator do? It should do one service. Uh, it's ideally limited to one service. And it does that service well. So that was difficult to scope. And as an example, I was trying to build an IAM operator. Um, at my previous role, our platform was built uh, only on top of uh, AWS. Uh, and we were having difficulties launching um, resources. So we were trying to look at operators as a way to completely automate this so we don't have to answer to any tickets or anything like that. So um, the one thing that we um, sort of struggled with was managing IAM. Uh, and I am his identity and access management service uh, of AWS. So we were uh, having difficulties with that. And uh, as if you have had experience with I am, it's not a simple service. It is a bit complex, especially when you have multiple different accounts that you need to connect uh, and so many resources that you need to manage access to. So that was very difficult to scope. Like, what does this I am operator do? Uh, what is the scope of it? The Cube Builder did a lot of scaffolding. During the scaffolding, it was easier to um, implement and, and see where to implement and fill in the gaps. But still, the reconcile logic wasn't easy. Trying to decide um, what is the desired state, what is the current state, and how to reconcile them together, these are not easy concepts to implement. And uh, specifically, when I uh, talk about this uh, control loop here, if you are 
um, interested in that, there's a book from O'Reilly on feedback systems. I think that's what it's called. I have it sitting over there. Um, feedback systems. And in that book, when you start reading it, it mentions that actually deciding on what is the proper input and what is this proper feedback loop is a difficult thing. You can think of this like in a concept of outside a concept of operator and Kubernetes. You can think of it as a queue uh, and a and a and a and something that is processing a type of job that is processing that queue. So it, the many times that I've woken up for an outage because the queue was not being processed fast enough because we couldn't figure out how to. Um, manage these input outputs and feedback loops. Um, I, actually, at the time, I didn't know about this feedback loop. In my head, I knew that uh, this made sense, but I just didn't know about them in theory. Um, the amount of times I've woken up for outages like that was was a lot. And um, it is actually the difficult thing to figure out how to reconcile these things. What are uh, the numbers that you need to never have your queue back up. So what is the uh, good number of output? What is a good number of input? And so that they don't oscillate as much as well. So that I found that to be not super easy to implement. I also found that because of the amount of learning curve it had, so uh, my team was very well versed with Kubernetes. We all had used it in production. We were using it in production. And we had a lot of experience actually writing uh, tools in Go. Uh, but still, I found that to have uh, a quite a bit of decent learning curve. So because of that, the amount of effort that you wanted to put into an operator, uh, an IAM operator, because you're creating operators in per service, uh, did not really, you know, equate to the business value. So, you know, this amount of effort just brought in like very little uh, business value for us and our team. We did have um, a storage uh, team that also tried to implement, yes, that is the book, Feedback Control for Computer Systems. Um, we uh, had a storage team that tried to implement an operator for their database. And the problem with that or with any of the operators was that uh, they're difficult to maintain. So if you create an operator for, uh, say, a MySQL. It just creates a MySQL database. Well, what about all the other things that MySQL does? You have to add those as, as features and support them. And if you are, for example, building features um, and supporting an operator that lives on top of a cloud system, um, and I bring AWS as an example because that's the one I have the most experience and what we basically tried to do was to create service operators for, um, you know, S3, for IAM, uh, and for different, uh, you know, services that AWS had. The problem with that was AWS and other pl cl platform as well are constantly adding features to their services. So you also have to constantly add features to your pl platform. Uh, to your operator, because if you are writing a platform as a service, which is the, this is uh, the operator's audience, the people who write platform as a service. Um, if you are doing that, you have some people who are using that platform and they might be frustrated uh, that, hey, I saw that uh, S3 has this new feature. When are we going to get that? Who knows? Whenever we have time to implement the feature, I guess. So you have a constant need to add features and support this. Another thing is that some people don't really care too much about this and it all depends on your goals and so on. Replatforming is difficult, but it is extremely tied into the Kubernetes ecosystem. You're, um, it's not something that you can say, oh, we're done using Kubernetes. We want to migrate to another platform that is not based um, in Kubernetes at all, so this operator becomes useless because um, the logic for that event-based API that gets consumed is all Kubernetes. You're extending their APIs. So if you want to just not use Kubernetes or move off the platform, 
uh, you have to just say goodbye to these operators you've written and just do your own thing. Another thing I've noticed is that um, many months ago when I was actually uh, writing an operator and, um, and when I was researching operators both for uh, to see how, what are the best practices to write one uh, aside from the queue builder book and that will take you so far, but you know, at some point you would want more. Uh, and I was trying to prepare my notes for this talk. I realized that there are pretty few success stories about operators. I don't really see companies uh, talking much about it. A lot of people just talk about it as a this uh, goal they want to get to, but I didn't see battle tested operators. Uh, and the, the ones I saw were from uh, platform as a service companies, uh, companies that offer that already platform as a service, which I'm going to go through uh, a couple of those um, examples. And the one thing I want to mention, you might just say, well, this is very anticlimactic. Uh, you just talked about operators and now you're saying that they're not a good idea to write my own. Um, yes, I am saying that, but there is a lot to be learned from the concept of an operator. Uh, and that's what I like about it. And that's why I like talking about them because um, in when you've been on call for distributed systems for a long time, uh, there have been many instances where you think the automation is lacking. Um, and a lot of times it's lacking in its ability to self-heal and self-correct. And the premise of an operator is that it does self-heal and self-correct. So you want nightly um, backup jobs in a database, yes, the operator goes, does that. I don't need to do anything. It's constantly reconciling whatever state you define versus the state uh, that is that is this current state. So it is, it, it is not possible to have a queue that is backing up with an operator. And the whole premise of that feedback control loop. Uh, I do really like that premise. And when you see it in action in other systems, uh, mainly Kubernetes's API server, the other system where you see it when cloud providers have auto scaling systems set up. Uh, again, bringing AWS as an example, because that's my uh, most experience. Um, with AWS's auto scaling, you can scale up and down instances. You can do it manually, but who wants to do that? You can also do it automatically where you define a metric. So you would say, if the request count is more than, I don't know, 1000 per second, scale up my instances this much and then scale them back down later. And what the behind the scenes, what the auto scaling is doing is constantly looking at the current state of your uh, instances. So yeah, you have two instances, you want to at least two instances running and you uh, have only uh, like 50 requests coming in. And then once your peak traffic comes in, it is still observing that uh, state and it will try to reconcile based on the metric that you've provided. It will scale up the instances to five to accommodate the load. So when it works, it's great. And, I, and, and the reason why I like operators and as a concept is to introduce that feedback control loop as a concept when people design distributed systems. Uh, because that's how you succeed, in my opinion anyway, in designing a distributed system that doesn't wake you up at 3 a.m. multiple times a week, which has happened to me for sure. Um, so and another, another question you might have is that the premise of an operator building resources on a cloud platform or so on and so forth sounds very good to me. So then you're saying not to do an operator, so what else can I do? You can still use operators, but you can use battle tested ones, which I'm going to uh, mention a few in a second and um, give you criteria of what I think a battle tested operator is. You can also use infrastructure as code. So things like um, Terraform and CloudFormation, these are the tools that, um, you know, Terraform you can use with multiple cloud providers, it's cloud agnostic, it has many features. 
Uh, CloudFormation is only uh, AWS based, but it manages and handles its states, it rollbacks if it fails, it has a lot of nice things. Um, and, I, and I'm aware that these can get uh, a bit too much to handle as well. Like at some point, if your company is like, you know, only 50 people and in, in, in one cloud provider in one region and you have 20 instances, uh, services running, uh, you may not think as Terraform be chaotic, but once you uh, add my previous job where we scaled to uh, many uh, AWS account across almost all of AWS regions, uh, and each of those regions had 500 something uh, instances running in it. It was like a very big op global operation. Um, you might find that Terraform and CloudFormation are not scaling as good as you wanted them to. And that's a fair assessment, but a lot of times that comes through not setting yourself up for success. Um, there's a lot of, and that's, I think it's a topic for another talk, that's why I didn't include them, but there's a, not, uh, but there's a lot of uh, ways you can extend the, these uh, platforms, like AWS CDK tries to achieve this where it generates code. So you write code to generate code. And sometimes that's an anti-pattern and, and it, sometimes I don't agree with that even though I have written um, code generators in Go for our Terraform code. That's how we solved a lot of the problems that the operator was going to solve for us. But a lot of times you can also use best practices on how to set yourself up for success using infrastructure as code tools. Um, Another thing is use managed services. We just talked about um, operators being the thing that launches your database, destroys it when you need to take backs up, backups of it automatically. Well, that's the thing that managed services do on most cloud platforms. Um, if, for example, you have, uh, again, using AWS as an example, uh, you have DynamoDB, which is a, a very highly scalable key value store for um, for AWS and other cloud providers also have similar products. And what DynamoDB does is that it has features where it can scale behind the scenes automatically. Uh, and it replicates it to multiple um, data centers and availability zones behind the scenes. So you don't have to worry about, um, you know, reliability of it or availability uh, of this database and the backups are also configured with a lot of these managed services. So if you utilize, again, depends on your goals. And I think most people's goals is to have uh, the differentiated heavy lifting from uh, the operations lifted so they can actually write code and write products. You can, you should use managed services and utilize those to uh, achieve your goals versus trying to, um, do managed services yourself. These are, the reason why I'm saying this is like, these are plat platform as a service company. So this is their job to write managed services. But in my instance, where we were authentication as a service company and running our services on top of a cloud platform, we were not in the business of having, running such a platform uh, as our service. So it took a lot of our time and effort that we could have put into our actual product instead. And speaking of that, there are some examples of good operators projects. And I find these extremely helpful to look at when I was trying to write my own, just going, you know, as you know, going through good code and looking at it is one of the good ways to learn. The first one uh, just came out yesterday. I astonished that as I was going through my slides and writing um, these slides, a notification came in for this AWS controller for Kubernetes. I guess it's KubeCon in Europe and that's why they announced it. Um, so essentially this is what we were planning to do uh, was to create an operator for different uh, services of our cloud provider but this is written by the cloud provider. So I'm more inclined to use this. Uh, I think they are supporting DynamoDB, S3, API Gateway, and a bunch of other services they have and more to come, I'm sure. So um, I found that blog post very interesting. Um, it is a rewrite of what they've done before. They've, already, they've done this before. 
uh, at the, the time where I was writing uh, operators myself, uh, they decided that they want to scra uh, scrape the whole project that they had, which was did not inspire confidence in me because I was like, well, if they can't do it, can we? Um, so they th did this project from scratch and as a result, um, I, I think it's in preview to, to be used. It's not generally available, but I'm sure it will be generally available soon. The, one of the most famous one is also the Prometheus operator. Prometheus, op Prometheus is an uh, observability tool. This one is one of the most popular ones. Um, highly recommend to look at that if you're interested in writing your own or just want to see how an operator project is set up and is working. Argo CD, Argo is a tool, um, a Kubernetes-based tool that does continuous deployment. This is also has its own operator. Uh, etcd is the key value storage behind Kubernetes. It's where it's, you know, stores everything um, it needs. It's that also has an operator written by CoreOS. Uh, so CoreOS, in, like I mentioned, in 2016, they came out with this operator framework. Uh, so they are the people who came out with the operator. If you are looking at uh, example code, obviously CoreOS is going to be the one place you look at um, as well. And as a last slide, I'm going to put our sponsors. Um, this year being virtual, um, it, I love virtual events. I love speaking on Zoom. I work remotely for a, more than a little bit more than three years. I, I love speaking on Zoom more than speaking in person sometimes. Um, it's thank you to these sponsors. It's great that we're still able to do this and it's great that Louisville has its own um, conference and it's very amazing. And now I'll take any questions. You can follow me on Twitter. Uh, I ramble over there sometimes. You can reach out to me on either of these platforms if you have any questions or if you're interested in any of these topics and you're like, oh, I want to dig deep more. Uh, do you have any resources or if you have any questions, you can reach out to me there. I also have another event, uh, another talk tomorrow at 1.30. If you can come to that, it will, it's going to be a great talk. I'm going to talk about cell-based architecture. And basically, it's an easy way to scale and your infrastructure and have it to be extremely reliable so you reduce blast radius and not cause a lot of outages or outages that affects everyone. So that's going to be a fun session as well that I'm looking forward to. I don't see any questions in the chat, um, but if you have any questions, let me know or reach out to me in the platforms mentioned. Uh, Jonathan put the link to that book in, in the chat. Uh, yeah, I will post my, um, if you want to, reach out uh, if you want to see that book and you know have a look at it um it is very it is a great book in my opinion it was very um it, it wasn't just good for operators it just changed my perspective of how i've been doing systems and how i've been um um writing systems and all these outages that i've woken up could have been uh, prevented uh, but if I, if we had that in mind, then there's also Red Hat also, yes, has um, a lot of good resources for how to do Kubernetes operators as well. Um, I don't have my slides posted yet, but I actually, let me just, I can just share the link, you know, it's a good thing about, um, you know, having my slides on the Google. And the sessions are also being recorded. Thank you, Tina. So yeah, if you have any other question, please reach out to me on those platforms. And thank you guys for coming to my talk. <laughs>